is the uh, sleepy time of day. You've had a nice meal, you're comfortable, seat's comfortable, and I just want to tell you, if you feel like sleeping, it's okay. It's a real ministry, actually, sleep is. I was in Korea a few years ago, and I was speaking to 200 pastors on Monday morning. Now, pastors in Korea, I mean, Sunday is terrible, but so is the rest of the week. The five services on Sunday, and every day of the week at 5 a.m., prayer meetings, morning meetings, afternoon meetings, evening meetings. And on Monday, after five services, they're exhausted. And so I was speaking on Monday morning, 200 people, and they were falling asleep. <laughs> now, I don't know what you do when you feel sleepy. I actually try pinching myself to make enough pain to stay awake. So if I see people pinching themselves, I know what's happening, okay? So I tried everything to keep them awake. I told stories. I used cartoons. I gesticulated. There's a... <laughs> so I thought, I'll teach on the ministry of sleep. On Psalm 127, verse 2. In vain you rise up early in the morning and toil late at night, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives sleep to his beloved. Verse 2 is explained by verse 1. Verse 1 in Psalm 127 is, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. And unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman watches in vain. So I said, you can't afford to sleep if you are running the world. But if God is running the world, you can sleep, you can trust him. It's a ministry. You're trusting God. So if you feel like getting into that ministry of sleep right now, get into the ministry. And quite a few of them did. So if you feel like sleeping, it's okay. But those who will stay awake, we're going to explore finding joy in work, at work. In work, at work. Interesting question, whether it's in or at. And that is an interesting question. The phrase, I think, comes primarily from Matthew 25 in the so-called parable of the talents or bags of gold. You remember the five made five more, the two made two more, and the one wrapped it up, kept it safe, but oh, my goodness, the judgment against that person. Thrust into outer darkness, you evil, slothful person. Why? Because nobody stole his talent. You know, he just kept it safe. He did keep it safe, but he didn't invest it. And that's what we're supposed to do. Now, with the five and with the two, five made five more, two made two more. The master says, enter into the joy of the master. Now, I know that's the theme of the Joy at Work book by Dennis Bakke. Actually, from the text, it's what happens when Jesus comes again. It's really an end times parable, which means that at the end, we enter into the joy of the master. I think we can experience that to some extent now. Okay, So I'm not just going to push it to the end, but to say, yes, we can experience the joy of the master now. But ultimately and finally, when Jesus comes again. It's a very, very good book, Joy at Work by Dennis Bakke. Um, his book is based on the very simple biblical principle that human beings are made in the image of God and are made with decisional capacity. We are made to make a difference. And so you push decision-making down in an organization so that people actually can make decisions themselves and feel responsible for their work, which brings great joy 
to people when they are actually able to make decisions and make a difference. In his book, Daniel Miller, 48 Days to the Work You Love, he observes that one-third of Americans say, I hate my job. Would it be different in the Philippines? Have you any idea? Do people kind of say, I love my work? Or do a lot of people say, I hate my job? Partly, though, because two out of three say they're laboring in the wrong career. Now, that assumes you've got a choice. And for a lot of the world, folks, there's no choice. A lot of the world. But in a lot of the world, there is choice. A lot of choice in the Philippines. And uh, some of the research and teachers in North America is that two out of three teachers don't like teaching. Well, can you imagine what that does to children and young people if the teachers don't like teaching? Yeah, I mean, that's, it's brutal. That's terrible. Very dangerous, even. So a lot of people are bored. I uh, don't know whether you've seen Charlie Chapman's film, Modern Times. He was one of the first filmmakers uh, using silent movies, you know, and uh, he expounds the dilemma of boredom in the water, modern workplace. He's actually shown him in a factory turning nuts onto bolts all day long. And as he walks home, he's doing the same thing all day long, evening, and so on. Mindless, repetitious work. And even a challenging career cannot guarantee freedom from boredom. A lot of people in the north, not in the Philippines, this would never happen in the Philippines, they say they're bored to death. Children are saying they're bored. Bored stiff, bored to tears, bored silly, bored out of their skull. These are phrases that we hear. Uh, surveys indicate that up to half of North Americans are temporarily or permanently bored. Okay. Now, like many spiritual maladies, boredom is not attacked and healed by attacking the problem directly. It's healed by the expulsive power of the infilling and liberating love of Christ, a greater passion. And we can turn boredom into prayerful waiting and even an active questioning of God. My soul, Psalm 119 is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. So my colleague who co-authored the book, Taking Your Soul at Work, Alvin Ung, I have to say he wrote this part. But he's describing, at work the hands of the wall clock slow down to the point of immobility. I'm looking up here. Is that hand moving? I don't think so. The daily seems to, day seems to last for 50 hours. You play solitaire. You shuffle to the water cooler and back. You answer a few emails, fight drowsiness. You water the geraniums, <laughs> glance at your smiling colleagues. Why are they having fun and you're not? You're stuck in the wrong job. You're bored. You can't stand your boss. Uh, you're disgusted at yourself for working long hours in a meaningless job. So... That's how some people feel about their work. Someone has said, it's Wendell Berry, professional education is education for homelessness. Now, it's an interesting thought that uh, a lot of professional education prepares people to be mobile. And uh, we happen to have, as I think I mentioned, three married children, eight grandchildren, and one great-grandchild who is supposed to be born two weeks from now. So I'm going to be a patriarch. <laughs> Think of it. A great grandfather. I'm not emotionally ready for this. <laughs> but uh, all our family live nearby. And uh, people say, this is amazing. Even people we were visiting with this week. They've got one child in Austria and another one is in Asia, and 
Another one is in North America. And part of it is our education for professionalism today prepares us to be mobile, leading us to become, as Wendell Berry puts it, itinerant professional vandals. We're permanently exiled from home. And so, and then upward mobility, consumerism, uh, all those things are huge factors today. Symptoms of restlessness. We carry out our tasks half-heartedly. We're disengaged from the work. Though we're present in the body, we're absent in spirit. Gradually, we begin to abdicate, justifying our responsibilities as other people's work. We fantasize about what we could be doing for great things for God somewhere else, and we change jobs often. Now, that's me. I used to change jobs every four years. So every time I did something new, Gail would say, okay, I guess it's another four years. But I've been at Regent College since 1985. That's 30 years. How come I stayed 30 years in this one job? Partly, it was a context in which I could reinvent myself every four years. <laughs> Partly. But also, I'm growing up. I'm still trying to find out what I'm going to do when I grow up. But anyway, that's another story. So, boredom, restlessness, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is normally associated with ecstatic experiences. Tongues, speaking in tongues, words of knowledge. And spiritual gifts are considered mainly, if not exclusively, for church ministry. InterVarsity Press produces wonderful Bible study guides. And I've uh, written, I think it's four or five of them. I don't know how many. They came to me and said, we'd like you to write a Bible study guide on spiritual gifts. Oh, I said, I'd really like to do that. I have two reasons why I want to do that. One is, I am convinced that spirit gifts are not just for the church, but for the world, for our workplace. And I would love to show in Bible study how people can discover their spirit gifts and use them in the world. The other reason why I want to write it is I don't believe in spiritual gifts. I believe in spirit gifts. It's not a transplanted ability that you get when you become a Christian. It's the Holy Spirit working through you. So I want to call this spirit gifts. They said, nobody will ever buy it if you call it spirit gifts. It has to be called spiritual gifts. And I finally gave in. I'm a very submissive person. I finally gave in, except open it up. The first sentence is, there is no such thing as spiritual gifts. <laughs> they are spirit gifts, the Holy Spirit working through us. The secular workplace is considered largely devoid of God and not a place where the Spirit ministers, like Abraham and Abimelech. We've got a couple of married people here, men, I mean, who are married. And I want to say to you, don't be like Abraham. Abraham had a very beautiful wife. And what he said to his wife was, if you really love me, oh, that is so manipulative. If you really love me, wherever we go, don't tell people you're my wife. Tell people you're my sister. Why? Because if you tell them my, you're my wife, they'll kill me and then marry you as a beautiful widow. So tell them that you're my sister, and that way they can have you, but I'll stay alive. Isn't that wonderful what a loving husband he is? Oh, don't be like Abraham. So he goes down to Abimelech's place, and Abimelech uh, looks at Sarah and says, Holy smoke, she's the most from coast to coast. And he says, I want her, and she's the sister of this man, Abraham. I felt the same way when I met Gail. I said, she's the most from coast to coast. I went back to my room in the university. 
and I did a backward somersault right on the bed. I'm not that athletic, okay? But, you know, it's amazing what happens. So he took, Abimelech took Sarah into his harem. And I try to imagine this. The night before she was to sleep with the king, she's thinking, oh, my goodness, what a dilemma we're in. And Abraham's outside the palace thinking, well, it looks like I saved my life, but oh, man. And so what happens is God shows up in a dream to Abimelech and says, you're, yeah, you're a dead man. This woman is not his sister, but his wife. So the next morning, Abimelech goes to Abraham and says, how come you deceive me? This woman is your wife, not your sister. And he says, by the way, have you ever been confronted by a not yet Christian about your lack of integrity? I have. That's what was happening there. And uh, so Abraham says, I thought there was no fear of God in this place. And there was. There was. So what we're going to call spirit gifts are not just for the church ministry, but for the work world, the Holy Spirit's involved. Now, the Holy Spirit is something all Israel longed for. Israel was not primarily distinguished by the law and circumcision, but were a people of the presence of God. I will put my dwelling place among you. I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people, a people of the presence, not primarily a people of the law and a people who are circumcised. God's empowering presence. And for Paul in the New Testament, the divine presence is the Holy Spirit, fulfilling the promise of the new covenant, the indwelling of God. We're actually the temples of the Holy Spirit. This is shoe leather spirituality. We're walking around as temples of the Holy Spirit. We can live in his presence every day, fulfilling the indwelling of God and the temple. Now, what does the Spirit do? As I said, the problem is that the Spirit is normally associated with the extraordinary, and some extraordinary things happen. But the Spirit is mainly empowering us for ethical living, for ethical living. And read that in the New Testament. You see it's there. The Spirit brings the powers of the age to come and brings to earth the kingdom of heaven, making it possible for us to live a way appropriate for those who are in the kingdom of God, bringing the future age into the present. So Ray Anderson at Fuller always asks his students, Sorry the text is so small. I disobeyed my own rule here. Which century is determinative for our understanding of biblical truth? Almost everybody says the first century. That's where it's all happened. And he says, no, it's the last century. When Christ returns to bring consummation to this pledge that he made by the gift of the Holy Spirit, it's the last century. The Spirit is preparing the people of God for this last century. The first century is normative for the revelation of God as the incarnation, the redemption of humans from sin and death. The return of Christ and resurrection from the dead constitute the normative praxis of the Spirit. This is the drawing which he uses. We're being sucked into the future. Now, I couldn't find it last night as I was going over my talks with you, but I photographed a church in Manila a few years ago. It was a Pentecostal church, and they had a big sign out the front which said, Back to Pentecost. 
And I wanted to show you that because it's completely wrong. It's forward. Forward. We're being sucked into that future which we have tasted in Pentecost. We're being drawn into that whole new way of life that the Spirit is pledging, witnessing for us. So the Spirit is bringing the future to the present and bringing gifts and spirit fruit for blessing both the church and the world. Actually, spiritual gifts is not a good translation. It would be better to translate them gracious bestowings, but it just won't work. It won't work. Gracious bestowings. And the Spirit anoints creational, God-given talents and abilities all from God. Okay? Now, I hope this drawing is helpful. I want to show you how spirit gifts and talents overlap. They're not absolutely identical, but they overlap. Spirit empowerments at the top are usually temporal or contextual. Let me give you an example of this. Sometimes the Spirit works through us in a particular context, but when we find ourselves in another context, the Spirit doesn't work that way. So, for instance, I was a pastor of a church once where everything I touched happened. It was an amazing experience of leadership. And then I was in another situation where I wasn't a leader at all. Zero. I thought, oh, I'm the same person. No, it's the Spirit works through us, specially and uniquely in the context we're in. Now, talents or God-given abilities are usually permanent. Now, I hate calling them natural talents. They're not natural. They're creational. They're from God. The word creation always invites the question, who? Who's the creator? So creational talents are built into us from God. Okay? I became a Christian at 18. At 13, I had a kind of stammer, and I determined that I was going to be able to communicate. And I started going into every public speaking contest I could get into. And I became a communicator. Who gave me the ability to speak? God. But I wasn't a Christian yet. So when I became a Christian, he took that away. Did he? No, he didn't. What he does is he anoints this creational ability that he's built into us and moves it a notch higher in effectiveness. I'm an organizer. I've always organized everything. So what happens when I become a Christian? Or how does the Spirit work? It doesn't make me disorganized. He helps me to do that even better. Okay? That's why I have put in the middle anointed talents. Now, I have a scripture for this, and it's in Romans chapter 12, where Paul, when he's talking about spirit gifts, not spiritual gifts, spirit gifts, he said, the person who gives with liberality. Now, everybody gives. Lots of benefactors. But not everybody gives kind of with generosity, with hilarity, with a kind of abandon. Oh, that's what the Spirit does with that creational ability. And then he says, the person who teaches in his or her teaching. Well, Christians aren't the only people who teach. But what the Spirit brings is another dimension of effectiveness. I would call it the anointing of the Spirit. And the person who administers with diligence, he says at the end on this passage on Spirit gifts. So lots of people administer, but there's an extra diligence that comes with the Holy Spirit. So what does the Holy Spirit do? 
He doesn't always give you some capacity that is completely unrelated to who you are. Most often, he takes who you are and anoints it, making it more effective and touching people for God with it. Okay? I think this is so liberating to realize you don't have to be someone other than you are to be used by God through the Holy Spirit who is blessing and anointing you. The Spirit inspires character traits that enable virtuous living and working. Character traits. We call these the fruit of the Spirit. My colleague James Houston says, self-control and gentleness and faithfulness are about ourselves, knowledge of ourselves. Goodness, kindness, and patience are about our relationship with others. Peace, joy, and love are about our knowledge of God. This is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not fruits s. It's a kind of ninefold dimensions of the fruit of the Spirit, the, the, the result of the Spirit's work in us, ethical living, the way we relate to ourselves, others, and God. And the Spirit inspires creativity. Now, here's a skill-testing question for those who are awake. What character in the Old Testament is the only person in the whole Old Testament of whom it was said he was filled with the Holy Spirit? Who? Anybody here a grad of ATS? Can you possibly graduate from ATS and not know who in the whole Old Testament is the only person that it was said was filled with the Holy Spirit? Not Samson. Yeah, he, he wasn't filled. He, he got it, but he lost it. <laughs> it's Bezalel, not Bezalbub. That's another person. And Bezalel. Bezalel was a craftsman in Exodus 35 and 6 who made beautiful things for the ark in the wilderness. Bezalel. He's a craftsman. The only person in the whole Old Testament. The Spirit fell on people, came upon people, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit to make beautiful things as a craftsman. I think that's fantastic. The Spirit inspires creativity. I get a creative idea. I think, wow, thank you, God. Because that's from God. And it's the Holy Spirit's work. And he also inspires good. And, oh, I gave it away there. And you didn't even read it. You are asleep. So I was asking a question, nobody answered. But the reason why, you're probably thinking, this guy is so dumb. He puts the answer up and then he asks, what's the, what's the answer? That's how stupid can you get? Okay. But he does inspire good ambition. I think there's a place in Scripture for self-affirmation, appreciating your value, dignity, talents, and capacities, and the profitability of your life seeing that your life and your investment leads to a worthwhile end. Matthew 16, 26, if you want a text. You know, I've heard some of the great preachers of the world. I can't remember anything they've said. But I do remember a sermon when I was a teenager, a late teenager. And he used, like Jesus, he used marketplace images. He said, you can do with your life what you do with money. You can waste it. You can hoard it, wrap it up, and keep it just the way it is. Or you can invest it. And I'm inviting you to invest your life in Jesus and his kingdom. I think there's a place in scripture for seeing that your life leads to a worthwhile end. Three biblical doctrines inspire ambition. And one is the promise of God. The promise of God is that you, as a people, 
will inherit the land, that you will be able to bless other nations, other people, and that you will be God's people. This is a precious promise that we find fulfilled in followers of Jesus. The second is the will of God as an empowering vision. I think I'm safe in this country of using this story. There's some places I can't tell this story. But when our children were almost ready to leave home, we had a couple of family trips, and one of them took us to the Middle East. We went, first of all, to Greece, and we were backpacking and living in very simple places, and every third or fourth day, we'd stay in a little hotel that had a shower, and we'd clean up and so on. We had a lovely trip. But in Greece, we went up to Delphi, and Delphi was the site of the ancient oracle where people went to consult the will of the gods. And you can go there today, and there is the remains of the temple where the priestess would sit on a tripod, that's a three-legged stool, on a round disc that had a hole in it. Underneath was a fire, and they would place on the fire narcotic leaves. And she would inhale the fumes and give an answer to your question. So King Crossius comes all the way from Sardis, Turkey, because he's about to wage war, and he wants to know whether he'll win or lose the war. I wish every American president had asked that question before they engaged in war. And so he says to this priestess, will I win or lose the war I'm about to be engaged in? She inhales the fumes, and she says, a great king will fall in this war. Well, you don't know whether it's Crossius or the other guy. It's ambiguous. A pregnant woman comes before there is amniocentesis. And she says, will I have a son or a daughter? She inhales the fumes and she says, son, no, daughter. Could be either. And the will of the gods in the ancient Greek world was tricky, ambiguous. We flew into Cairo, Egypt. Sitting at the next table was an American. I really love meeting Americans when I travel because they talk. Canadians don't talk. They sit there politely. But Americans talk. And so I turned to this guy. I said, you don't look like a tourist. What are you doing in Cairo? He said, I'm here training the pilots on the F-16 fighter jet in the Egyptian Air Force. I said, that's an amazing job. What is the biggest problem you face in your daily work? That's my question for church leaders, okay? And he said, my biggest problem is when the red warning lights come on in the cockpit, the pilots don't do anything. I said, why don't they do something? He said, they say, if it's the will of Allah for the plane to crash, it will crash. Oh. Think of it next time you fly. Because the word Muslim means submitter. And the Muslim worshiper is prone on the ground. And the will of God in Islam is inexorable. Inexorable. That's a hard English word. Learn it. Absolute. We took an Arab bus across the desert. It was a grim trip because my daughter had eaten fish the previous night in Cairo. And there's a saying in Egypt, if you eat the fish from the Nile, you'll never leave the country. It has a double meaning. First, so sweet that you'll just stay there and keep eating it till you die. The other meaning is you'll die. And she got really sick. Oh, my goodness, she was sick. And we had no WC on this bus. It was an Arab bus. And, oh, fortunately, we had a flat tire in, in the middle of the desert, all that stuff. I carried her across the border into Israel. But as we crossed the border from these little Bedouin communities with a few stalks of palm leaves and a scraggy little donkey, we came to this amazing, flourishing, creativity, enterprising,
pomegranate trees and hay swaying in the wind and magnificently designed things. And I said, how come? I know there's problems with this, but how come? Because the will of God is not ambiguous. It's not inexorable. But the will of God for the people of God is an empowering vision of greatness under God. Like the dream that God gave Joseph that his brothers would bow down to him. And he pushed hard and tried to make it happen. And all that was not so good. But in the end, it was right. God gave him a dream of greatness under God. And that's the dream of the will of God for us. It's an empowering vision. Read about it in Ephesians chapter 1. And then the Spirit of God as personal empowerment. So when we're looking at motivation, there's a right and a left side. The right side, I would call the negative side, where we're motivated by anxiety. If any of you have studied in the MBA program, you probably know that a very famous person who wrote the book on the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism said that people in Germany after the Protestant Reformation were motivated by anxiety as to whether they were saved. Because Calvinism preached this awesome transcendent God, but it also, and Calvin didn't do this, but it also preached double predestination. Some are predestined to heaven and some are predestined to hell. And so you don't know if you're elected to go to heaven. In the old days, you could go to a monastery and prove by your devotion that you're among the elect. But the monastery door was closed by the Protestant Reformation. I'm not sure that was a good thing, but that's what happened. So where else can you prove it except in the workplace? Where you, your zeal, but then Calvinism taught one more thing, which is thrift. You don't spend everything you make, you reinvest in the business. And that's exactly what it takes for, Calvin, for capitalism to thrive. Selfish ambition, again, bad thing, and greed. But on the left side, which is the positive side, faith. A good ambition. Paul said, it's my ambition to preach the gospel where it's not been hurt. A good ambition. Gain, yes. Not greed, but gain, yes. It's good. That's a good ambition. So on the right, you've got a culture of consumerism, a culture of greed, and a culture of predatory competition. Predatory competition is where your identity is wrapped up in eliminating the other person. Whereas on the left, you have a culture of opportunity, the need of the world, and the times. Now, which is most powerful, most dominant in you? Okay? And I have to tell you, my motives are mixed. Okay? I wish I could tell you I'm totally on the left side. <laughs> Not there yet. Okay? Mostly, maybe. But those are reality, and the Holy Spirit is working in us to be on the left side, giving us good ambition. That culture of consumerism, greed, as compared with need of the world. And the culture, through the Spirit, brings joy at work as well as in life. Joy is a lot more than happiness. It's a deeper, more lasting, and more satisfying. It's... And happiness is an emotion. You feel good. You have well-being. You can have joy when you don't feel good. When, you're, when things are not going well. Joy is not circumstantial. It's a God connection. It's a God infusion. It's a whole person exhilaration. Blissful well-being. A kind of spiritual transcendence. William Barclay says that joy is the distinguishing atmosphere of the Christian life. I think he's right. He shows how the word for joy in Greek, which is translated greeting often in some of Paul's letters, when he says, hi, 
greeting, but it really is joy be to you, joy be to you. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And Jesus himself said, I came that you might have joy and have it to the full. I've told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete, John 15, 11. So when Dennis Bakke says that God intended that the workplace be beautiful, exciting, satisfying, and filled with joy, he's right. He's right. That's God's intention. And we can actually experience that. A joyless workplace is where workers are lazy. They are in it primarily for the money. They put their own interests ahead of what's best for the organization. No one wants to be responsible. They need to be constantly told what to do. So how do we get joy at work? And what is joy at work? First of all, there is the joy of working itself. And I have joy in working. And getting into it, heart and soul. Interesting how in Colossians 3, Paul says to the slaves, put your heart into it, get into it. And not just when your master's eye is on you. The Greek word is ophthalmic, from which we get the English word ophthalmology, or an eye doctor. So people sometimes are kind of eye doctor people. (laughs) They only work when somebody's, the boss's eye is on them. Now my dad, as I told you, was president of a company. And I worked in that company in everything except being president. If I were Asian, I could have become president but I didn't, okay? So I worked out the back, I worked on punch presses, I worked in the tool room, I worked in the warehouse, I got really dirty and all the rest, and I also worked in the office. But I noticed that my dad, every day, would come out of the office and come out into the factory part and the warehouse part, and he would talk to every employee. Uh, Yesterday you told me your wife was quite ill. Is she doing better, you know? And he did this. He loved his employees and really cared for them. But I noticed that as soon as he came out of the office into the back, everybody became very busy. They really worked hard. And as soon as he went back into the office and the door closed, they stopped working. They pulled out their Coca-Colas and their Playboy magazines, and they just kind of stopped working. And Paul says to the Colossian slaves, he said, Not just when your master's eye is on you, but from the heart and soul. So there is a joy in working. And uh, I'm just so thankful I can work. And it's, it's joyful to me. But there's no perfect fit this side of heaven. None. There's no perfect fit this side of heaven. So... Cardinal Wyszynski was the mentor to the late Pope John Paul II. He wrote a book called All You Who Labor. First title was really a very good title called Working Your Way to Heaven. Protestants don't like that title. But um, he said, humankind feels an almost divine joy when they contemplate the signs of their labor in material works. Just as God, during the seven days of creation, declared repeatedly that all he had made was very good, So humankind in their work sees a reflection of their own image. The people who give themselves over to idleness will never know that. So it's a beautiful description of the joy of working itself. But there's a joy in working for love, realizing for whom we are working. Family. Yes, in my case, my wife, my children, my grandchildren, uh, single people as well, can be working knowing they're going to benefit others from it. Loved ones and neighbors near and far. And ultimately, God himself working for love. There's a wonderful story of a Jewish rabbi walking in a town late at night. And you know how this happens. Sometimes you're walking late at night and you're walking down a street And there's another person walking at about the same speed. And they're kind of beside you. And uh, the rabbi turned to this man and he said, Who are you? He said, I am the night watchman. 
security guard, you could say, a night watchman. After a while longer, the night watchman turned to the rabbi and said, Who are you? He said, I'm a Jewish rabbi. A little farther along, the rabbi said to the watchman, Who do you work for? And the watchman said, I work for the village council. A little farther along, the night watchman asked the rabbi, Oh boy, who do you work for? Every pastor, boy, that's a hard question to answer. But it's hard for the rest of us. Who do you work for? And the rabbi said with great discernment, I'm not always sure, but I'll tell you this. Tell me your present salary. I will double it. And you just stay with me and keep asking me, who do you work for? Because Paul says to the Colossians, it's the Lord Christ you're serving. The joy of working for love. There is a joy that flows from feeling of having completed some tasks that will be useful for your neighbors. We're glad when we've been given some preconceived form to matter. And through this, our work can achieve some kind of human usefulness, working for love. There is a joy in working with God, not just for God, but with God. I'm a co-worker with God. God's with me. Work becomes for human beings the source of a great new joy from the vocation and elevation by which he has been honored from the knowledge that he's acting hand in hand with the Creator. We're actually co-working with God. We're partners with God. That's in Corinthians. We are co-workers with God. Oh, oh, there's a joy in working with God. And there's a joy in working in God. Entering into the Master's joy. Matthew 25, 23. Come and share your Master's joy. Nehemiah 8, 10. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Note, not just joy in God, but the joy of God. God's joyful being. You fill me with joy in your presence. Psalm 16, 11. God is a God of joy in creation. Proverbs 8, 27. In redemption, in consummation. You will find your joy in the Lord. Isaiah 58, 13. And joy is fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. God is no dead pan autocrat, but a delightful and delighting being who invites us to enter God's joy. Is there a further joy? And here's where Cardinal Wazinski poses a very challenging thought. One more human joy. The joy that comes from the fact that work done with love helps to achieve man's redemption. When we undertake work from love of God, this merciful God lets us share in a task of great honor and efficacy and that of atonement. It follows that work in the sweat of our brow both cleanses and ennobles us. Now, I don't know how many of you have a Roman Catholic background or are presently a practicing Roman Catholic, so please forgive me if I am not saying this as helpfully as I can. But one of the problems that Protestants have with Catholics and their literature is that Catholic authors often and Wisinski has just done this. They often use the word salvation when Protestants use the word sanctification. Protestants want to say we're justified by faith alone, by the grace of God, not by anything we accomplish. Okay? Catholics say, yeah, that's true. But part of our salvation is the working out of that. 
which happens in all the suffering and struggle that we have in work and in life. And we say, no, that's sanctification, that we're sanctified. It's like James says, count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when various trials afflict you, because this is going to produce character in you. And the Catholics say, well, that's what I mean by salvation. So there's where there's a huge misunderstanding between Protestants and Catholics, uh, I think. And I think Wazinski here is not saying we're going to be saved by the struggle we have in the workplace. I think he's saying we work out our salvation in the context of really tough stuff that actually becomes a kind of joy because we're accomplishing something he wouldn't use the word sanctification, but I will use it. The improvement of our person through the tough things we experience in the workplace. How do we get joy? By resisting the urge to run away. Uh, Benedict says, do not be daunted immediately by fear and run away from the road that leads to salvation. That's what a lot of people do when tough times come. Big challenge comes, they take off. He, Bernard uh, Benedict says, no, don't do it. And I've spent quite a while in the uh, Middle East, and uh, particularly in the monastic community of Athens in uh, Mount Athos. But one of the great sayings in the monastic community is, remain in your cell. Your cell will teach you everything. Okay, let's translate that. Remain in the job you're presently in. I'm speaking to Zanette here. Don't retire. <laughs> Remain in the job you're presently in. Zanette. Aaron Barrow. Because it's going to teach you everything. And what happens is it gets a bit tough. Or we get bored. And we head off to find some other fancy. Something that we'll be happy with. And we don't learn what we can learn by staying with it. Resist the urge to run away. Get into it. Paul in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 7, 17 and 20. Remain where you are, where you were when God called you. Well, the first instinct people have when they become Christians is, oh, I'm going to quit my job and go to Bible school. And Paul says, no, stay where you are. Why? Because you're going to learn so much right where you are. And in fact, uh, what really does happen when people become Christians is they immediately get immersed in a Christian community and they lose all their non-Christian friends. And in two years' time, they can't talk to a non-Christian. They can't. Remain where you are. You discover that your present situation, 17th century Francis de Sales, your present situation is exactly the soil needed for nurturing the virtuous life. They are what God wishes us to practice at this time. Don't run away. Uh, Richard Baxter, a Puritan, England, suffer not to your fancies to run after the sensual vain delights. These will make you weary of your callings. Translate that. When nothing interests you at all, ask whether you're responding to the call of God in your life right now. So, resist the urge to run away. Secondly, Galatians 5 says, keep in step with the Spirit. Line yourself up with God and God's leading, which is surely the same thing as remaining in God's love and keeping the commandments, which are simply to love. So, some thoughts for reflection. We're going to have a small group time, and I don't have an agenda for you, I do have a couple questions, and uh, these are questions for you to ponder a bit about. If you would like to be in a small group of two, that's fine. Uh, if you're in four, make sure that everybody gets to talk. Everybody. But definitely three would be better than four. About what do you frequently daydream? What gifts and talents do you wish you had? And what have you already learned in the situation you presently occupy. And I'll come back to that and put it on the screen. But on this scale, where would you place your attitude towards work? 
on the far left, bored, tolerant, invested, very motivated, my idol. You may want to discuss that. And how would you move from where you are to where you should be? What steps? What spirit resources? And what dealings with the seven deadly sins or the works of the flesh? So, we're going to move now into a small group reflection time. You may want to say, what have you already learned in the situation you presently occupy? Or you may want to discuss this scale from bored to my idol (laughs) and how you can make a move from one to the other, one direction to the other. So in groups of two, three, or four, and uh, we're going to uh, have a short break at the end of this, but not at the beginning. This is a good way just to get right into it.